Hello, it's a pleasure to be with you today here um, at Cello Bello uh, during this um, very unusual and unprecedented times. Um, we're very fortunate to still have our music and of course the cello, the instrument we all love so much. So it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I would like to talk to you a little bit about the exposition of the Dvorak Cello Concerto, the concerto that all of us love so much, so dearly, widely accepted as the greatest cello concerto ever written, and a candidate for the greatest concerto ever written um, for any instrument. And so I think that's, that makes quite a piece. <laughs> um, so, um, and what I would like to talk about, I thought this uh, piece is a particularly good example um, basically, what I'm interested in here is whatever interpretive choices or cello playing choices uh, we make as cellists, that it supports not only what's on the page, but sort of the parameters that we know uh, or what, what uh, has been referred to in the past as what's behind the page. Um, the sort of the facts that we know about the music and um, those facts um, create sort of a, well, a parameter for the possibilities to interpret and to make music. Um, if you want to use a sports analogy, we can say those parameters create a ballpark. And then within the ballpark, we probably would prefer to be in the infield than the outfield. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, to be within uh, the ballpark and then within that ballpark and with any piece we're interpreting, there are, you know, infinite choices and possibilities for an uh, interpretation. So um, looking at the Dvorak, um, you know, when you're pretending that we don't know this piece, never heard it before even, well, probably the first thing you would do is to uh, learn the notes and just, you know, become acquainted with the material, see what parts are the same, what parts are different. And then once you have a, an acquaintance or familiarity, um, then you, you start trying to figure out what the piece means, and we have to draw on certain things uh, to do that. Um, it's very helpful if you already know other pieces by that same composer, because then you learn what's called the musical language of the composer. Um, so when he writes this type of writing, he generally means this, and this type of write, writing, he means that. Um, and then within that, then we have to have a strategy to, um, to work on the piece, and to continue learning about it. Um, you know, what's really special, I mean, there are many special things about this concerto, but to me, one of the really special things about it is it's not just a cello concerto. I mean, we can, I can think of many concertos, as can all of you, uh, where the cello is really kind of it, and basically the orchestra is serving more an accompanimental role. But in this concerto, uh, the orchestra, it, it's, it's, I like to think of this piece, there's a lot of similarities to the Brahms piano concertos in that it's really a symphony. And then perhaps even more than the piano concertos of Brahms, uh, it's a symphony concertante, which means uh, there are so many important other solo instruments uh, that have major roles in this concerto. And so it's important when we're uh, learning and, and, and even of course when we are performing that we're hearing those other voices that we are um, always in some kind of active dialogue. And the other main um, aspects I want to talk about um, in as I go forward here is um, the idea that uh, that this uh, concerto, uh, yeah, it really it really utilizes uh, the instrument and really uh, and, and also just to give some uh, tips how to go about things. So um, uh, if I'm looking at the very beginning, um, it's important that we are familiar with the introduction, but if I just first see uh, the, the entrance, we have two markings on the page. We have risoluto, which is pretty self-explanatory. It means resolute. And then um, there's also this quasi improvisando. Now, if I had never seen that before, um, I might be a little perplexed, meaning I wasn't familiar with the piece. Um, and so then we have to investigate. So we're looking here and, um, and we see, well, where have I seen this, uh, 
main theme or entrance before? Well, certainly at the very beginning of the uh, Tutti, where the orchestra begins the piece. And so I think what's important here then is that we give it a quasi improvisando type feel, but at the same time, it's still recognizable that it's the same figure that we heard at the beginning. Now, in this case, it's very, I mean, it's, it is an obvious thing. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, striking theme, uh, but, um, and okay, so we know that. Now, what about how this phrase is put together? Well, the first phrase is what? Um, you can argue four bars, you can argue eight bars, <laughs> you could argue more than that, all the way up to number four if you want. But, but say the small pieces, well, this, um, th say going to the next statement of the theme. So that would be uh, four bars. Um, so then we have three parts, basically. We have this. And here's the second one. The second part, and then we have the long two bars. So that's what we have. Um, and so, okay, fine. But then, how can we show those parts within a phrase? Um, we, I, if you look at it from a gestural point of view, you could look, if I play it to this direction, and then this way, and then forward. And then we come to the famous chords. And now we're talking sort of practically. Um, so the, the issue with the chords, we have these accents on these notes. Um, and the question is how to get triple stops to sound. Um, what I found to be helpful is a slightly more horizontal approach to the string. Um, and then to, to, in terms of the weight in the fingers, not to be too heavy or not to have too strong of a contact. So that when you put the weight in the string, that you still can open and close the forearm. And, and by doing so, you create sort of a stretch feel. Now there's a, a, a point when the finger's strength gets strong enough that I can no longer open the arm. And in which case I would do it. So you get stiff like this. Um, and so what is helpful, this spread to make these chords full enough and resonant enough that they're heard. If we don't do that, and sometimes if we, we're also not starting from the string, uh, then it can be a little and while here with nobody else playing, I can hear that fine. If you get into a hall of 1,000, 2,000 seats, it's helpful to have a broader approach and also for the clarity and quality of the sound. So uh, bending the thumb a little bit, having flexibility in these hop knuckles here, and then not having too much uh, tension in the fingers. And as a general principle anyway, there shouldn't be much tension anywhere until the weight is applied because otherwise the, uh, the sound quality is going to suffer. Um, so, so that's just a practical thing, but and from a musical standpoint, why play these chords uh, broader? Because um, if we look at the beginning with the winds, the clarinet solo. Because it's, it's a lyrical line and, and even though it's accented now, I, I, it, it would probably be useful to reflect on what's already happened. Um, and then of course, um, it's it's helpful that you know it's this is a big entrance. I mean, when we come in, because it's the first time we've heard the key of D major, and D major, as we know, is going to play a pretty significant role in the piece. Uh, the of course, the ending of the first movement, the entire last third of the last movement, all the tr the triumph over uh, you know heroic struggle basically, and so here. It's tempting to just come in and give it your all. And of course, we want to make an impressive entrance, but 
I would argue that four bars later, it's fortissimo, and so you only start forte. And also, when you're planning your dynamic structure over a piece that you save uh, something for the ultimate climax of the movement, because that's the real payoff. And um, I've heard, you know, and as, as have you, in very impressive performances with a big opening, but if that they used a little too much in it, then later it was difficult to have the feeling that this is the high point of the piece. Um, so, so that's what I'd recommend. Now, of course, we have four more bars, fortissimo at an elevated state, on starting on E, the same kind of thing. One other thing I will mention, this Dvorak, I was talking about parameters at the beginning. Um, this is from 19th century romantic music. And so stylistically, what does that mean? Well, um, we know that in the classical era that the long notes should be long and the short notes should be on the short side versus the romantic era where actually it's the taking of the uh, enriching, uh, the enrichment of the small notes is where the real expression lies. So for example, if I take, well, I'll take the second uh, part of the phrase now. If I start here. <laughs> and it's good and I'm fine but did you notice I'm not putting anything on the 16th notes and they kind of go by and you don't really hear them very clearly um, however if I allow the vibrato to continue and give just a little extra uh, traction in the bow for those small notes <laughs> stylistically uh, helpful to the music. It, it, it can add to that quasi-improvisando quality. Um, now, when we uh, get to the next part, so we have four bars, four bars, now we have the C major. And we have a lot of sforzatos, um, and then we have C major, and we have this bowing, where we have three slurred notes and a separate note with a dot on it, and um, it's like, okay, what is that? <laughs> well, um, we know with Dvorak that he, uh, his music is centered around folk music, Bohemian folk music. Um, we know that, and so, um, uh, and that's going to even play a bigger role at number four. But here, um, so how do you know how to play this? Is, is it... I've heard that, or is it... something something else um, I think uh, one of the obvious places to first look is look in the score what else is going on here and uh, we see right away in the second half of those bars we have the winds playing so we have that going on and even though the winds are playing in it it has kind of a fanfare like uh, sound to it almost like it could be played by trumpets um, and so and also these sforzatos and so, so what's important however we want to contrast or match what uh, the other instruments are doing that we speak the same language that it's it's sort of in it's in the same ballpark and so if I want to say uh, do something like I just did so how do you practice that? Because it's the non-legato strokes that give us cellists the greatest challenge versus legato, which the cello does pretty naturally without so much uh, sort of planning, <laughs> so to speak. So um, of course, slower, but the sort of what goes into it, it, it's important what kind of bow distribution we use to find the right amount of bow, the right part of the bow. And in this case, uh, a good place to start would be, you know, three notes at a certain, uh, uh, with a certain amount of bow, and then the same amount of bow for that one note going back, so you can stay in the same part of the bow, and uh, but then we have to compensate for that one note getting so much bow by, uh, you know, putting a lot less weight on that note so that it doesn't stick out because the sforzados are on the the first notes of each four note grouping. So, so I would practice. Mm -hmm. 
sooner, which means the arm will come up a little sooner than it would with a, a normal bow change. Um, it's important that we prepare our bow strokes when we play so that it comes from a musical gesture. Um, I can also practice if I just want to make sure I'm getting the string, feeling the string from a standstill, like... <laughs> for how the fingers uh, absorb the weight and, uh, and release, but after that we have to combine it with a gesture or it becomes something very mechanical. Um, so, so that's sort of a technical way to go about, and then I should mention also that to change when you're preparing both, I mean you only got two things here, you got the slur and you have the separate note. So you want to prepare a legato feel in the arm for the three notes, and then with that raising the arm, we stop that note and then prepare a non-legato. A legato is more like swimming, that feel, but uh, in the case of the bow arm, you're going side to side like this. So it's, and always you can see the upper part of the arm prepares the next direction. Uh, with non-legato, it's similar, except the parts of the arm are working together. And, uh, and all these things work um, when you're not holding tension in your upper back, which all of you cellists out there I'm sure are very aware of and, and teachers that teach not to do that. And, and the power source, of course, is the back. And that, that needs, so we can't be too tense in the shoulders or we're not getting that weight there. Okay, great. Now moving on, uh, we get to, we come down this sort of little cadenza-like thing to this, to the F sharp. <laughs> playing which in a way is kind of a complicated figure and so when you respond to that I think it's if you look at the writing what we play is pretty different it's, we just straight eighth notes and then straight triplets so to uh, play it in a way that uh, evokes con uh, contrast and in, in dialogue so perhaps real singing in, in with relation to their uh, sort of rhetorical speech. And then when we get to these trills, the famous trills, I found teaching this piece, uh, trilling is often not the most uh, apparent thing for cellists. Um, it's, yeah, it, it requires some practice and thought um, usually the problem is people are trying to trill, which is a natural thing to do, but we have to remember that trilling is much like vibrato in that it's actually a release. So when I start a note here, I start the trill, but then I get out of the way. I let the finger continue on its own. It's when I try to trill that it gets harder. So that's fine. However, you still won't be able to trill if you have too much weight in the, in the left elbow because you're putting a lot of weight then on that first finger and all of your fingers. And so then if I put a lot of weight in my left elbow, I won't be able to. That's all the faster I can trill. I, I can try to force it, but it doesn't really work. And so it's important to have uh, a buoyant feel in your left arm when you trill, prepare a lighter feel. And that means before I play, I prepare a gesture. I don't just start from a standstill. So the arm is involved and then there's a rebound and it's that rebound that takes the weight off and then however high you come. So you can, you can it changes the speed of the trill or allows for the, the changes of speed in the trill. Okay, so that's a technical thing, but now what usually happens here is we're so caught up in trying to trill and play in tune and all the other things that we want to do as good cellists that we forget there's a chromatic scale here and musically chromaticism in 19th century music, uh, there is, it means there's a lot of tension there or music or building in this case, uh, building 
musical tension we know by the harmonic progression. So we want to try to show that. And from a practical point of view, uh, what is helpful is if I breathe with the bow to build this line, and then if it's in four counts, that when I get to the fourth beat that I already feel or prepare in my arm the, the next direction so that I can connect those bow changes. What often happens is you hear one bow at a time, but we don't really hear the connection through the bow change, and especially at the points, because that's the area that's weaker, of course, in, in the bow. We, to get weight here, you need some more skill than here. So um, let me just play this for a minute. So if I take a breath. So it's important to build that line just like the, the, and we know to do that because of what the woodwinds do, and, and we're accompanying the flute melody and the chorale of winds. And now when we get to number four, uh, I mean, there's many ways to go about this section, but I will point uh, your attention to this. <laughs> Which is, this is real folk music, and, and you find this, this bass line in, in the Dulka dances of Dvorak, and, um, and that, um, just briefly, I wanted to mention that I think that's the goal in this piece as musicians above cellists, is we want to make the Dvorak cello concerto sound like every other piece ever written by Dvorak. And when we have rich performance histories uh, with great musicians, great performers, but for the next person to play or the next uh, artist, we have to sort of peel back all of the char charisma of these performers and, and their individuality and try to get to the source of the music where these people took their ideas from to build their own interpretation so that we can truly make it ours and try to unlock what's called the inner truths of these masterpieces. That's what makes them valuable. It's not that, you know, the golden mean and all that beautiful architecture is great, but it's the substance of the music. That's why it's valuable, and that's what makes it uh, greater than a lot of other music. And so we have to try to unlock those truths and then find our own way to present those things. So when we have this at number four, we have to remember it, this is dance music, but at the same time, we have another force at work. We have the key of B minor, and the key of B minor uh, is in a, the way it comes back to that um, kind of gives the feeling of an inevitability. The way this first page develops, it's, it's kind of, in a way, sounds like there's no escape from that key. I mean, he tries to go here and he tries to go there and ultimately still in B until we uh, make it to the second theme and then are, are, are entering another subject, we'll say. So here we have uh, a few, just two things. If we just look at the page, we have quarter notes and then we have the 16th with the staccato marking. So there's a lot of, um, uh, th th that's just a general contrast. But to give it the dance feel, we have to prepare gestures at number four. So if we... And I've heard a lot of people, they, they come to me and play and very well and very nicely. Which is good but you can tell those quarter notes kind of end so I think if it's real dance music you'd probably if you follow through the gesture as a preparation for what comes next is useful and then also there really isn't the B minor feel it, 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 it doesn't it should feel a little bit like you have to go and there's nowhere else to go and and I think the reason for that too is you have this this quite majestic opening of the piece, and then it leads to number four, and then this is in a way where it's truly one sixteen to the quarter note. Before you have quasi improvisando and this type of thing and recitative playing, and now here not. And so to me, that's an indication this goes, and also there's more sixteenth notes, which 
as all the romantic music is an indication of movement. So, um, and then, okay, fine. So we, we do that. We have the spiccato. Um, there are different ways to do spiccato. I don't have enough time to talk about spiccato today, but um, I, I'll just say that I uh, try to keep it a little more on the horizontal side to be a little more melodic since nothing else is going on here except. And then it, other than that, it kind of is all you. Um, okay, and then we have uh, just, I would just briefly mention but when we get to this part, that we should, we should separate the feeling between uh, in the arm between the spiccato and then prepare the, the singing legato. When we get a few bars later, um, I think in performance, what's useful is to think of the dissonant notes when we were going on here. it's those notes that show the struggle and then we have something really interesting here where I stop we have a basically motivic uh, diminution we have by the half bar and then by the beat and then by the eighth note so we have this going on um, and so that is only adding to the excitement. That's an indication of the musical thread. It's becoming more and more intense. From a practical standpoint, we play with broad bows here. Because if we don't, it doesn't really project in large halls as well. And here, too, we've all heard which actually character wise works. It actually works. But um, if you want to get the notes themselves a little clearer, if you just use a little bit more bow than you think, then it helps the sound be more resonant. So you, in other words, you just get a little bit more in return for your physical investment. Um, fine, we get to number five, another statement of the theme. Only thing I will say is the famous shift up to the G what often happens, I find people playing, uh, they come to me, is people are concerned about the shift. But they get the G and it sounds beautiful, but then they get the G and they think, ah, oh, I made it. And then they forget the rest of the phrase. <laughs> so in other words, we have to sing to the end of that phrase there so that when the winds come in, they don't feel like they're out in the pasture by themselves. So if I'm going, and then to vibrate that note and keep so that it can so it hand it off to them I could have stayed perhaps uh, louder longer but that's still the gesture is right and then we get here whatever in character we're moving towards the second theme so it's just a question of what you're going to set up and now comes our beautiful unbelievably beautiful second theme that we all love so much um, if I look at the music um, I at, intuitively I just want to sing it out you know from the beginning but what I see here actually is pianissimo <laughs> and uh, dolce and and these so I think um, we can sing it out, and of course, you're not going to play pianissimo the same way you'd play in an orchestra blending with 100 people. You are the soloist, but at the same time, we need that quality of sound um, that's uh, more personal. Um, going back to those parameters, the ballpark, we again, the facts, what do we know? Well, we know that this second theme is Dvorak longing uh, for to, to go home to his native Bohemia. Uh, he wrote this concerto in New York City. He had been in America. He was really homesick. And that's why the, the, the key word to this theme is nostalgia. Uh, just to be so nostalg uh, nostalgic for uh, going home. Uh, I think it's helpful in this second theme to uh, have long-term planning. 
we have basically four little pieces to make the whole phrase. And um, sometimes a technique that's useful in practicing is to um, sort of play too fast and scan over everything. It's like flying over the music to see what's there, which reminds me for all you basketball fans out there, I love basketball, about ABC free flight when they were trying that 20 years ago. <laughs> Didn't last very long because it kind of made you dizzy. But nevertheless, the, the camera was flying over the, over the court, and of course now we have far more advanced things than 20 years ago. But, uh, but the point is to have an overview. So if I play this too fast, It's not wasn't dramatically fast, but but it was fast enough that you can see uh, how it all ties together, and through that uh, and where the seams are. So we have there's one seam basically every four bars. So so that's important to know in as we design things. Um, I would say, looking at the dynamics, that we're going to end up in an animato and forte. Uh, we have pianissimo at the beginning that we want to probably choose, uh, um, and for the nostalgic feeling, a more intimate sound. And then we have another thing to perhaps ponder about. One of those things is, do we want to try to orchestrate our sound here? To you know, who has played this theme so far in this concerto? Well, I think it is the principal horn. And so, do we want to try to build on what the horn did and emulate the horn sound? I could do something like that. Um. So that's sort of a gold type horn sound or I could right away go for something more like the human voice perhaps like uh and both are valid so it's but it's just a question of and and then you consider with the human voice what range am I in well this is kind of tenor like and if I go up here, I might enter alto, even soprano land. So, the, so to try to emulate those sounds. So th these are ways to create a color on the instrument, you know, just from an imaginative point of view. And then after that, we look at contact point and all the, the goodies downstairs, <laughs> how to do that. Um, okay, good. So, and then also we can talk about timing. So if we have, if we want to make it nostalgic, we probably won't start playing on the front of the beat because that would like kind of like I did when I was playing faster. So probably to be a little on the backside and a little bit pulling on people's hearts until we get maybe halfway through. Because at that point, it seems like the phrase turns around being a little more optimistic and you can make what you want of this. To me, maybe it sounds like he's imagining he's actually going home and maybe the animato is like a vision of home in the distance coming. So, so, and then in terms of mechanics, so vibrato may be the beginning a little on the slower side and as the musical thread develops, the intensity can add. It's perhaps nice halfway through a little shimmer in the vibrato. So if I'm playing this kind of richer, change the feel in the left arm. a little more uh, ecstatic or, or becoming more animated uh, as we head towards the animato. Um, and now uh, what comes after this, we're uh, transiting to 
the famous arpeggiated um, chords, basically. And, and in a way, you could draw a connection between these chords and the beginning, even though they're different chords going different places, but it's, it's kind of a similar idea, just arpeggiated. Um, there are different approaches you can take to, these, uh, to this passage. Some people try to emphasize more the articulations themselves. So they might do. Sort of a, a type of harder ricochet. Um, I try to emphasize a little bit more the, the lyrical aspect. So I'm trying to match what the uh, woodwinds are doing. Um, singing there um, so um, and you can do that again a little bit more horizontal with the bow the approach to the string and then if I will come off the string it will be in this case from the string uh, and so, so and then to try to shape it in a way that makes sense with the other solo instruments because in a sense you're not really the main show here you know it's, it's the beauty and the singing of the woodwind chorale that's going on behind you so there are I mean there are many ways to do it many valid ways I would just say always think how you're going to position your playing in relation to what else is going on. Uh, and once we get uh, past that, we're up to this momentary sort of pastoral moment. And again, you're important here, but you're not the only person who's important because you have uh, solo clarinet, solo flute, and those two bar phrases. And so again, probably the emphasis here is going to be on lyricism, singing especially coming out of what we just came out of. So So however you want to do it, um, and you can add more portamento. Let's see what was that. for so yeah you can design it however you want but just probably the other instruments kind of to me allude to something on the pastoral side and now we come to this famous uh, group of chords dotted rhythm 16th notes um, I was looking at it recently and I in, uh, again where have we seen something like this before this dialogue between the solo cello and the woodwinds. Well, probably that C major section in the beginning. This, um, that thing. Because, it, but that's more sort of in response. In a way, this is sort of now more together because, of course, they play. So we have to play with that. And uh, so, however, we want to play this. Um, it needs to be, again, belonging to that world. Um, and it's similar to the, uh, the writing for the cello, similar too, because we have long note, and then that short note. And what's important about the short note is, first of all, it has enough dimension that you can hear it, and that it has a clear articulation on both the front and the end of the note, because if I do, that doesn't sound very, you want to throw, doesn't not not very much like the Czech language or like the right the language of Dvorak. So we need that uh, uh, sh uh, fine and very clearly marked articulations. With that being said, when we're not playing the dotted notes, it would be helpful in our body and our arms if we're going to prepare a more lyrical feel or singing that's that's like the slurs. So if even the first chord here. Uh, so. that's marked the 
Non Legato and the other ones are sung pretty much. Uh, musically, if we look from here to the end of the exposition, it's pretty much rising music the whole time. And music that rises a lot chromatically in romantic music is probably gaining in intensity. And in this particular instance, I think it, it you know, a lot of the folk music element is very, of course, prominent, but it really shows this excitement and, and, and solidifies this vision of going home. Uh, and so after these, this um, passage, oh, one more thing I want to say. Those two bars I'm just demonstrating right now. I also think musically it's more interesting if we don't always play the gestures in the same direction. So if we go... Fine, but they, they, it's, if we can sort of uh, change with the harmony or the harmonic impl implications. So what I chose to do that time is sort of a little bit question and answer. Or you could build the whole thing. Uh, and I'm also changing that um, 16th note to, uh, so they're not all perfectly uniform. There's all kinds of things you can do as long as, uh, again, you're kind of speaking the same language as your friends behind you in the orchestra. And then when we're going here, to show those harmonic changes. And then here, we've heard a lot of versions here. Only thing I'd like to point out, yes, the A naturals coming up have dots on them, yes. So we know they ha they need some kind of articulation, but we think about who plays before you. Right, the horns, and so and then you can decide. Well, do I want to try to answer them like a horn, or do I purposely want to pretend I'm a different instrument in the orchestra and treat it differently? Um, only thing I'll say about dotted notes is it doesn't necessarily mean shorter. It just is, it just means our, it's a type of articulation. Um, and then these are repeated notes, and because they're repeated notes, they probably need more space between them, because otherwise you get this kind of it's kind of unclear. But if I really and now this is the next thing I want to talk about. Uh, mine was a little short, my last G, because it's the it's related to the first page. Which, but here the G is longer. But I sometimes have people coming to me playing, and technically there's no space there, right? But I would like to draw your attention to the flute. that figure there that and and then on top of that we actually have these uh, sforzatos every two bars so to me that's pretty clear indication that he doesn't just want one long uh, you know seamless line I think he's looking for figures within that line and so if that's true even though that G is longer um, it makes sense there's a little space before the next sforzato and that it it, it, it isn't uh, is related to what we've already heard on the first page, because after all, it's the same notes, uh, very much related. Um, so, so, so that means. And then we get there. By the way, you notice how I finish up? That helps the resonance go up. If I finish like this, this this has a different effect. If I do, well, okay, my cello rings anyway. But uh, but if you generally, if you if you go down, it tends to stop the sound. 
and and so meaning it'll just cut it off and and that has its uses certainly musically but in this case maybe send off the other instruments like the strings that come in the arpeggios heroically and then we move now to uh the ending of the exposition uh basically two main things just it's uh, i just wanted to mention one is the the um, dotted triplets so that again more angular probably moving the arm together like <laughs> Which is fine but then on top of that we also want to have a phrase direction why because harmonically nothing's happening here not very much just colors within the same arpeggio basically so that means and, and in a way also rising not really resolving these this first inversion chords so again we're asking questions perhaps so and then and now i know in the original we start these down bow for anybody who has a question why i started up bow well it's it would be more of just that would be the phrasing approach where you're looking at everything rising and then the answer to these questions is with the, the orchestral chord where you come down. And the last thing I'd like to say is if you want to help your friend, the conductor out, if you play, since it's in a, a sort of Pesante slowing down probably a little bit like recitative if you have a fermata. If you play that eighth note pickup more like just a quarter note in the new tempo, kind of uh, creates more clarity not only for the conductor but for the 100 plus people uh, sitting behind you. And the more people you have in a group, the more you can simplify things that and when people are hearing things at different times all over the stage, it's helpful. So anyway, I would like to thank you for uh, listening today to my presentation on this exposition of the Dvorak Cello Concerto, I would uh, love to take any questions from the field that anybody might have about anything I've said or just anything you've been thinking about in your own work. Um, yes, so I will pick up my phone and see what's coming in. Okay. How to practice the trills? Well, yeah, how to actually practice the trills on the first page. Well, right, so I explained how it works, but in terms of actually practicing, well, um, there are quote unquote rhythm, rhythmic trill practice, which is good for evenness, but you just have to be careful and be aware that when you're doing that, uh, let's see if I can, that you're using the drop feel in the finger, which is the, like you put the finger down, you feel the release with the weight. If, you, if you're holding, or if you have too much tension in the first finger and you're pushing, then this kind of work can make you actually tighter. So that's important. Um, so there's that type of practice for evenness and d different rhythms. And notice how everything I'm doing is with a prepared pulse or feeling of the beat. And then, so that's one type of practice. Probably also, I think it would be very useful to not be measured and to not think that way, but to just prepare the left arm with the beat, raise the finger and the arm together, bring it down together, and then with the rebound the arm and let go of the second finger. And it's this buoyancy and the, pre the preparing of the uh, uh, sort of soft or you want to call it a legato feel in the left side uh, that, that allows for these, this more fine type uh, motor activity to work. So those are the two recommendations I can give on that. Um, what would be the one error? we should uh, avoid when playing the Dvorak concerto. Well, um, <laughs> uh, there, 
basically, um, I'd say that the air to avoid is, you know, um, I had somebody come to me 20 years ago and they said, um, well, well, that's the, I said, why do you want to play this piece that way? And they said, that's how they did it in the recording. I don't even know where to begin because, uh, you know, there are many wonderful recordings, but recordings are good as an example of maybe how, uh, you know, somebody interpreted it. And it's, it's helpful to, for us to hear sounds and things, but ultimately we need to go back to the source and, and, you know, make decisions for ourselves. And every great musician I've ever encountered has told me exactly that. So, so I, I'd say the mistake would be just to basically, uh, rely on a performer without uh, asking questions for yourself. Um, let's see, could you please show us how to have a relaxed and wide vibrato for a first position? Uh, it's harder, yes, you, you are right. In a way, it's funny because in a way we're always taught that it's scary to play up high, but it's actually a, a much more natural in terms of the position than say first position where you're exactly right, the, the arm is collapse like this out of a wide vibrato you know I it's it's everything in the cello is playing the cello is tension and release so basically to make sure the arm is relaxed there's no tension until the moment you put the weight down and then you engage the muscles and I found it useful that if you can feel the string a little in the in the fingertip uh, and to think vibrating along the string and not so much just down I mean, you come down with the weight, but then to have what's called a touch in the finger. And, and um, also when you are putting, uh, applying the weight and using the muscle tension, that we more or less try to keep an equal amount of tension in all parts of the arm. So whatever you're using in the finger, that it's equally supported in the arm. And, and these are, this isn't something that you do. It's, uh, well, it is in a sense, but we're talking, these are very small increments. It's more awareness, being aware. How much am I using? Uh, just to, and then uh, I should also mention, well, if you're talking about the width of the vibrato, the thumb is very, very important. Just the tiniest release of tension in the thumb widens the vibrato uh, because we uh, uh, relax the uh, contact in the hand felt between whatever finger is down in the thumb because that's what creates the feeling of position. So if we relax, and then if, if we get to a point where um, there's no tension in the thumb, we lose all center to the sound. So, but you can go all the way from the widest uh, vibrato, and then you add more tension. And then if you want a more violinistic vibrato, you can do that. Um, great. Um, Okay, an another question. Hold higher on the stick. Is there, yes, okay. Well, yes, I do hold higher on the stick, right? I don't have my fingers always all the way down to the ferrule here. Um, part of the reason, um, this, is, this is a nice bow that has high ends on it. Um, the older style, this, uh, from the mid, this is a French bow from the mid uh, 1800s. And it has high ends. If if we if you play the quote unquote modern bow like uh, Lamy and uh, Sartori, that design, well, the first person to do it was Warren. Um, then you have less distance here between the ferrule and the top of the frog. And so for me, I was just more comfortable doing that, and also it was easier for me to feel the sort of the horizontal opening and closing. If I do the other extreme which if I put my fingers uh, below what I call the border, <laughs> generally, unless you have extremely long fingers and have nowhere else to put them, I tend to uh, not to recommend this because even though it feels secure, there's less flexibility and it kind of fuses the, the arm. Uh, and and uh, so there's less possibility. So, but yes, I'm a little bit on the other side of things where I'm not always all the way down to the ferrule. And uh, it just helps me feel uh, where I am in the in the stick. Actually, um, good question. Um, let's see. Clarif uh Oh, the trills in the coda of the first movement. Well, okay. Well, let's. 
quickly take a look at that. Um, I just want to see something. Um, uh, oh, do you, oh, those octave trills? <laughs> well, how to practice these? Probably I would practice the finger if you want. And then you can add, add, uh, but I solve it by not playing the octave because I don't, the reason is I don't see a, I don't think it helps the performance or adds much to the audience. We have to remember in the 19th century, double stops and octaves were symbolic of, of intensification, strengthening the music, but in actual physical terms, it's actually weaker because your instrument is dividing the resonance by more than one pitch. But um, to, to practice that, yeah, I would practice like I talked in the trills in the first page and then maybe add the thumb after that just just so that you have the trill action going well for those. And then of course you can always tune it to the lower one. Um, okay, so um, practicing the tricky passage after rehearsal six. Um, yeah, that you, I assume you were referring to the, this, uh, yes, the, of course, the ricochet here. Um, so, well, there's, yes, I, <laughs> There are, there's a lot going on here. You have string crossings, you have uh, position changes and thumb position here. So if we start with the left side, um, well actually, let's do it the other way. And I'll tell you why, because if the bow isn't working, you can forget the left side. Um, so on the, on the right side, you ba basically you want to keep your, more or less, your bow arm angle on the A string level or the high string because then when you go down to the low strings, you will have the weight support you need versus if I start my arm, say on the G string and try to play, see it sounds kind of weak, but let's try now starting on the A. Yeah, a lot more powerful, right? Because it's a better weight distribution. So I, I used to, I used to, I still do, but I used to practice it more when I wasn't as good at it. Um, but so the, it's, it's this stretch idea like I talked about. It's very much related to the chords I explained at the beginning where you want to be on the high string angle. You want to uh, be lighter in the weight in the fingers so that, so that you can open and close the forearm but still have... And then to pay also more attention to where you are, the feeling of the stick by doing so. And it's, and it's never 100%. If you only feel the stick, you have no support of weight. And if you only feel under the, the feeling under the hand, then you don't have as much control of the stick. So it's always finding the right amount. But here, so it's like if I try open strings, and then too much bow and more weight than I'm going to use. Now this type of practice is for improving the quality of the sounds. So then if you do that a few times and, and, and you speed it up, then naturally a few things is going to happen. The, the amount of bow you use is going to be less because there's less time to play. Um, and then the tone will be better because you have good traction and then your mind will be more clear because you've felt those motions that you want to do. So I find that however you're ultimately going to play it, that's useful, uh, that type of practice. Um, I will say before you embark on this type of practice, uh, try to figure out the sounds and the things you're aiming for so that you can sort of apply that as you practice too. Um, so it's not only a technical thing at the end. Uh, good, okay, and let's see. Um, great. Oh, and oh, oh, you know, I should just quickly mention too, uh, people practice, and rightfully so, on the left side then. And also, more challenging maybe. And all of that is great, I recommend it also. Only thing I would add to that is this buoyancy and feel, having the feeling of the musical pulse as you shift from one part 
of the instrument to the next. And by doing, we, we want to stay along the fingerboard, but at the same time, um, I think one of our uh, great cellists and teachers of the past, Aldo Perizzo, talked about something called the bunny hop, which is basically just uh, uh, to, to uh, stay along the fingerboard, but to adhere to how the body works, feeling uh, circles along so you can uh, release weight and, and land uh, at the next location as you shift up and down. Very good. Um, let's see what we have here. Um, do I have Slava's double stop triplets or triplets on one string? Um, I don't think I do. What, what I do have from Rostropovich is something I learned from a teacher who uh, studied with Rostropovich as his fav a famous left hand staccato. <laughs> this kind of thing. But what I added to that is this same, what I just showed you in the other passage is this tension and release. So I would practice. <laughs> which makes the notes clear with those releases in the fingers. So you're coordinating the release of finger tension with that motion. And it makes things a lot clearer and it, uh, it also keeps you from getting tight and allows you to continue much longer than if you don't do that, which is why I go to the trouble to, to do that in the first place. Um, okay. Um, Oh, good question. What would you do differently in an audition versus a performance playing the Dvorak? Well, probably the, the main difference is in a concert, you're going to take a few more risks than you're going to in an audition, meaning, um, but like how you go in an audition, there's always a little bit more, perhaps of a slightly defensive approach. But with that being said, I think it's, most helpful to think of an audition as a performance and just another performance because um, ultimately if, if you're not performing in an audition it's not going to sound how you want it to sound anyway and I don't think you'll be impressing anyone uh, so it's audition is just yeah it's, it's an examination so you just have to be very solid in your but ultimately it, it is important don't forget the performance aspect and, and that needs to be practiced near an audition too. the the act of performing um, uh, at the, uh, but perhaps you're not going to do something just you know off the cuff as you might in a concert because maybe the perfection of getting the perfect note or whatever is maybe less consequential you could say so um, and, and just like making a recording too and when you make a recording uh, you're probably a little more careful than if you're, there's a little more grit in the sound in a hall of 1,500 people, they're not going to necessarily hear that out there. But on the microphone, you do hear that. Uh, so good question. Um, let's see. Um, which Boeing would you recommend for rehearsal for? Well, that's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I like the, what, I, what I did in the sense of... <laughs> The only reason I like that, I can make it uh, more articulate too if I want. The reason is just for change of gesture. I, I know people do, which is good for articulation. It's, it's always a question of what are you gaining, what are you losing? Um, but from a gesture point of view in a dance, that probably has less gesture to it. But it's not to say it's invalid. It's just that you're favoring one thing or another. It's, it's, it's always a balance of things. So that's what I would say. And then, of course, the 16ths are pretty explanatory, self-explanatory. Um, uh, since following up regarding the elbow, since you mentioned playing relax, relaxed, does it mean that you can rest your arm on the cello in the higher positions? Yeah, um, relaxed is a dangerous word because... You have to have great intensity to play, to make music on a cello. Relax only means, we're, when we say relax or referring to that, it's, it's tension release. So to make sure you're always releasing the tension. Um, uh, because when you're, of course, playing big, 
and and the hardest thing for a cellist is when you're playing at a very high intensity or dynamic level it requires a, a lot of physical strength but to have the same kind of release functions uh, going uh, while when you're playing that intense and it's it's very easy to stop uh, releasing tension and have it build up because it's you're exerting more um, so to be but in a sense right it's everything on the left side as you move around it's all about weight distribution so when as you know when we're talking about vibrating on the third finger up here we want to maybe move the arm slightly forward just a little bit so that we have a better balance on that finger but without changing the angle completely of the arm because if we start doing this, then the, at least the probability of playing in two and goes down. Um, so, so we want to try to keep the, the, um, the percentages as high as possible. Um, and so, but yes, when you're in thumb position, right, it's, it's, it's that release of weight. The same as here. Here you can feel it with the hang of the arm. Here um, you feel it by, right, it's kind of like setting your hand down on the table, the same kind of thing. And then from then, and so that's relaxed is in between the notes, which also in between the notes is where a lot of the music is. Uh, it's, it's not only the beauty of the tone and uh, what goes on in the notes, it it's what goes on between the notes, how you connect them, and which uh, helps create the meaning. So anyway, I would like to thank you all for being here today. It's been my pleasure speaking with you and um, I, uh, I hope that you continue to enjoy your performances uh, when we're all able to perform again and your exploration. We're so lucky in a way to have this time to do the things that we've always wanted to do but haven't had a chance to do, uh, to really explore the music we love and, and, and just aren't we so lucky to have music. Um, you know, that's something that um, nobody can take from us and and we are continue to find innovative and new ways to share music with people and to to continue our important work in this world so thank you very much for being here and i look forward to seeing you again sometime or wherever that may be there's a good chance that it'll probably be online first take care <laughs>